Member statements. The member for Oakville. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Just two days ago, the Persian community around the world came together to celebrate Nowruz, the Persian New Year, making the beginning of spring in a season of renewal and hope. This year's Nowruz celebration included the Half Seen Bazaar celebration in Oakville. I was happy to attend this amazing celebration and event in my home riding of Oakville. Over the course of three days in March, the Half Seen Bazaar became a joy of hub and cultural exchange. I want to recognize and thank Bida Fene, whose dedication brought to life an event that was nothing short of incredible. Persian Heritage Month is celebrated throughout March. Thanks to the great members from Carleton and Aurora Rourke, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. The Legislative Assembly of Ontario passed Bill 271 in 2021, proclaiming March as Persian Heritage Month. With thousands of years of history and tradition, Persian culture is rooted in one of the oldest civilizations. From ancient Mesopotamia to Cyrus the Great's founding of the first Persian Empire and beyond, Persians have held at, held at home the center of countless empires, trade routes, and cultures for centuries. Over the past century, Ontario has been proud to welcome tens of thousands of Persian immigrants growing into the largest Persian community in Canada. I want to wish everyone a very happy and pro prosperous New Year's, and may this year be the fresh beginnings of peace and happiness. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. During pre-budget consultations, the Finance Committee had the opportunity to hear from people across the province who were struggling. Despite living in the richest province in Canada and during a cost-of-living crisis, our provincial government skimps on paying for the services that people need right now. Educators in my community are running their classrooms on as little as $100 per year. How does that set kids up for success? Boards are running massive deficits while the government refuses to cough up money for legally mandated increases to CPP and EI. Conservatives are failing. Education is an investment. Decades of liberal and conservative disinvestment and cost-cutting targeting Ontario's youth have resulted in an education system on the brink. Remember when a conservative minister admitted on a hot mic they were deliberately creating a crisis in education so yeah. they could cut, destroy, and privatize? Yep. Here we are again. Children are our greatest resource, yet governments reward their rich buddies while Ontario's kids go without. School violence is at an all-time high, and kids aren't getting mental health supports. Conservatives pretend there are supports in schools, but no one across the province said they could access them. Ontario is dead last when it comes to post-secondary funding. Dead last. Conservatives are getting an F grade in education. Stabilize the system. Give kids the tools to succeed. Reverse the $1,200 cut per elementary and secondary student you've made since 2018. Help post-secondary institutions make young people's dreams a reality by increasing funding with annual compounded increases of 11.75% for the next five years. You have the money. Spend it on kids. It's their future. You can do it in Budget 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize a great Canadian and Taiwanese hero, Dr. George Leslie Mackay. As we take the opportunity to celebrate him today on what would be his 180th birthday, his legacy of service to the people of Taiwan has never been more uh, prominent. George Leslie Mackay was born and raised right in Oxford near the village of Embro. Mackay chartered new paths as the first Presbyterian missionary to Taiwan. He went on to establish a mission in the town of Tamsui, which remained his home for the rest of his life. Mackay embraced the island's customs, traditions, and people. His generous and accepting spirit compelled him to serve his community in a way that he could. He spent almost 30 years building schools, founding churches, and practicing dentistry in his adopted homeland. Mackay advocated for women's rights and spoke against discrimination and championed public health care. Some of his most notable accomplishments include building Taiwan's first school for girls and a major hospital in Tamsui. On his birthday, we celebrate Mackay's legacy of investing in Taiwan. Having laid the foundations for innovative education and a cutting-edge health care system, Mackay would be proud to see Taiwan reap the benefits of its now prosperous and mature democracy. 
As our trade ties become stronger every year with increasing bilateral investments, I'm grateful to Dr. George Leslie Mackay for helping to establish an enduring friendship and shared confidence between Taiwan and Ontario. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. This morning, I want to share an example from my writing of why privatization of health care system is harmful. We all know that when the Conservative government of Mike Harris was in power, they privatized home care. Private companies were going to make home care more efficient, serve more people, offer more care. None of that is true. The privatizations of home care made hundreds of millions of dollars for private companies, shareholders, and dire repercussions for people needing care. Take Tina Sr., beautiful six years old son, Alex. Bayshore gets paid 1.5 hours of nursing care daily when Alex is in school, but they only schedule the nurse for 15 minutes. What happened? His mom, Tina, a nurse with over 20 years' experience, had to quit her job to keep her son safe. Mrs. C. from Hanmer agrees to take her husband home from the hospital while he awaits placement in a long-term care home with home care services. Of course, home care never shows up when they're supposed to, but get that speaker. They have a meeting. Her daughter mentioned that she would be there after work to help care for her dad. Now the only time Bayshore is available is after four, when the daughter is there and when the family says, we don't need you. Bayshore takes that as a refused care, their uh, cancel appointment, they get paid and the family gets zero care. This woman is burning out. The list goes on, the privatization does. Money for shareholder, suffering for people who need care. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to recognize the Burlington Lions Optimist Minor Hockey Association. I'd like to congratulate Bloma for being a successful recipient of the Government of Ontario's OTF Capital Grant. Bloma received $25,000 for new hockey equipment to promote more participation of goaltenders in minor hockey. This funding will help break down barriers for players who don't have access to goalie equipment, allowing all players the opportunity to participate in goaltending. Hockey is an integral part of the Canadian cultural identity that brings together communities and creates lasting bonds. Players develop confidence, they learn good sportsmanship, camaraderie, and a sense of community. Youth leagues like Bloma teach players valuable life skills, promote active lifestyles and contribute to mental health and well-being. That's why our government continues to support organizations like Bloma to ensure aspiring players and goaltenders have the opportunity to re reach their potential goals. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Seniors in my riding of Ottawa West Nepean are being gouged by Alavita Lifestyles, and this government is letting Alavita get away with it. Mm. Residents at Park Place in the Ravines are being told that they need to pay thousands of dollars more per month in order to retain their housing. In one case, an elderly woman has been served notice of an increase of $27,000 more per year. Another resident has received notice of a $24,000 increase. Speaker, I doubt that there are many of us who are working who could afford to pay that kind of increase in our housing costs, and these are seniors on fixed incomes. These residents feel like they are being forced out of their homes, forced to abandon their friends and their community. Some of them are also feeling so scared and isolated by the high-pressure tactics that Alavita has been engaging in that they are having trouble eating and sleeping. I reached out to the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, who said, it's not their problem. I reached out to the Minister of Seniors and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to ask them to shut down this predatory behaviour. They literally responded with talking points, saying that retirement homes can charge whatever fees they want. This is completely unacceptable, Speaker. Seniors deserve a dignified retirement, not to have their home held hostage to increase the profits of a private developer. Shame on this government for siding with the developer 
rather than with the seniors. It's time that they actually stand up for seniors and come up with a plan to stop this kind of price gouging. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand today to applaud our government's $70 billion transportation investment across Ontario, including Scarborough Sub-Extension, which serves Scarborough and beyond. Our premier leadership of this ambitious effort enhanced connectivity, minimized travelling time, and reduced congestion for residents and tourists alike. Educational employment and recreational activity will be easy, easily accessible. Transportation infrastructure improve economic growth and attract investment and create jobs. The extension improvement of public transportation accessibility to residents, especially those with mobility difficulties. Scarborough Subway Extension is a major step towards a more integrated activity active and sustainable Scarborough and the Greater Toronto Area. I appreciate the Ministry of Transportation, his associate Scarborough MPPs and Metrolink team for inviting us to attend the site visit progress update. Great work. We are getting it done for the people of Scarborough and beyond. Thank you very much. Mr. Hey. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise with profound gratitude from for our government in securing uninterrupted learning for Ontario students. For the first time in nearly a generation, our government is successfully negotiating agreements with four Ontario teacher unions, ensuring stability for families and students alike. As a parent for four children, I recall the challenges we faced during teacher strikes, balancing responsibilities while scrambling to secure childcare. It is not an easy feat. I do not want my children to go through the similar hardships with their own children. We are committed to equipping our young learners with the foundation skills necessity for academic success. The back to basics approach is well received by all parents in my riding of Richmond Hill. They say, finally, we have the crucial skills in reading, writing, and math for our children. Yes, it is a solid groundwork for our students' future academic endeavors. On behalf of Richmond Hill, I express my heartfelt appreciation to Minister Lecce and our Premier for championing these initiatives. Together, we're ensuring that Ontario students receive the education they deserve, one that prepares them for the challenges for tomorrow while fostering love for learning. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Good morning, Speaker. This week, the Chatham Kent Health Alliance was proud to announce the unveiling of local Indigenous artwork at its Chatham Hospital. Adding art at the Chatham site was made possible by the Innovation Grant Program, which allowed staff, physicians, volunteers, and patient advisors to bring forward ideas for positive change that benefits patients and improves the quality of the workforce. After a call for submissions and voting by the Staff Engagement Council, the successful artist entries were made by Celeste Noah of the Delaware Nation, which now hang proudly in the ambulatory care waiting room, the dialysis waiting room, the intensive care unit family waiting room, and the reflection space. Each piece is accompanied by a descriptive plaque for visitors and patients to learn more about its meaning. Collectively, Noah's vibrant watercolor artwork reflects the rich history and traditions of Indigenous storytelling. Hospital CEO Lori Marshall and Board Chair Deb Crawford were both on hand to congratulate Noah and commemorate the installation. Noah is a self-taught artist who researched and took up the hobby during the pandemic 
and stated she used her knowledge and creativity to paint people, her people, wearing their regalia colourful and in motion. Deb Crawford noted, Ms. Noah's artwork serves as a powerful expression of connection to land, tradition and spirituality. I can't be more proud of her hospital's exceptional care and this young artist's successful contribution to this beautiful private space, public space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. That concludes our member statements for this morning. Introduction of visitors. I recognize